everyone to the Investment and Dispute Settlement in Post-COVID-19 e-conference by the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. Please allow me to introduce our distinguished moderator, Ms. Loretta Malintopi. She is an independent arbitrator based in Singapore. She was designated to the exit panel of arbitrators in 2017. She also appears as counsel and advocate in state-to-state -state disputes before the ICJ and ad hoc interstate arbitrations. We are also very fortunate to have Loretta as a member of the governing board of CIL. Loretta, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Zawei, for this introduction. And I want to welcome all participants and thank you for joining us for this fourth session of the COVID-19 webinar series organized by the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore. Our session today will focus on investment and dispute settlement issues post COVID-19. Our world is confronted with an unprecedented global crisis that continues to raise a variety of challenges and has caused fundamental changes to our way of life. The effects of public health emergency go well beyond health issues. The IMF has warned that the economic downturn in 2020 will be the most severe since the Great Depression. Governments have been compelled to take extraordinary measures to help contain the spread of the disease and there has been, and there may be for years to come, be a high human economic and social price to pay. When it comes to international investment law and policy and the settlement of investment disputes, a number of questions arise relating to the impact of COVID-19. These questions arise across the uh, cycle of uh, the life of an investment, from the admission and establishment of an investment by a host state, to the application of measures to existing investments, to the resolution of disputes between investors and host economies. The session will attempt to provide some answers to these questions by giving an overview from the speaker's different perspectives of the challenges that are faced by government, international institutions, and investors as a result of the extraordinary measures that are being taken to contain the pandemic. In terms of the organization of the panel, each speaker will have an intervention, will provide some remarks for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I will take questions from the participants at the end of the overall presentation. I just wish to make a general disclaimer on behalf of the speakers, the opinions that they express are solely they, their own and they do not necessarily reflect the official views of the entities they represent. We have the great fortune of having excellent speakers uh, who are great experts in their respective fields and I look forward to a great discussion. We start with Anna Novik, who is the head of investment policy of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Anna will in particular focus on the restrictions that states are implementing or contemplating on both inward and outward flows and the implications on investment policy. She will also touch on the recent policy note that the OECD issued to address these issues. Anna, the floor is yours. Thanks, Loretta, and uh, thank the Center of International Law for, for the invitation to this workshop. Uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, the COVID-19 has created disruptions that are unprecedented. Therefore, this kind of dialogues and involvement from the academic and also from uh, different governments and, uh, and uh, international organizations uh, is key to understand what is going on and also to see how we can tackle this, uh, this situation. I, I would like to provide a, um, a presentation uh, with a broader context for this discussion that we will have today. And, um, and I, will, I want to start with the uh, basic issues. Huh? As, as you mentioned, this COVID pandemic crisis <coughs> A dramatic health and social implication and this has uh, a strong economic disruptions and government interventions are needed 
uh, because they, they need to tackle the pandemic crisis and also they need to see how to keep economic afloat. And mean that government intervention is a fact here. As you mentioned also at the macroeconomic level, you mentioned that GDP is now expected to, to contract by 3% uh, globally, according to IMF and OECD, but also trade it will be strongly impacted in um, WTO numbers are from 12 to 32 percent of, uh, of uh, decrease and also a foreign direct investment OECD in the uh, forecasted in the in the in the most, most optimistic scenario FDA will decrease by 30 percent um, that also have similar similar date like 30 or 40 percent I mean that is uh, we are in a, in a situation that is pretty heavy, I would say, or, or serious. And if we look at FDA through developing countries, and we realize that developing countries receive uh, mainly on primary sectors and manufacturing sectors that are being very, very affected by this pandemic, we also expect that they will be strongly affected. We will talk today about government measures. These policies that have been implemented will and are impact, impacting private investment, including foreign investment, uh, both some, some positively, but most of them, I would say that uh, more disruption than, than positively. In terms of measures, uh, we can distinguish between measures that are mainly applying to protect public health and others that are mainly applying to sustain economy. At the end, both are measures, but I want to distinguish because I think that the measures to protect public health, for example, are this lockdown, curfew to dif uh, different degrees, shut down on non-essential essential business that are not able to operate remotely, temporary taking property rights to support hospital and address crucial shortage. We have seen also uh, 70 countries implementing a uh, restriction on non-agricultural sectors. Uh, and mandatory productions in some companies uh, to re produce ventilators, masks. These measures are here and are more focused on, on tackle the, the, the pandemic, the health issue. Also, we have a lot of measures that are main objective is sustain the economic. Some of them are long-term and some of them are short-term. Uh, some of them uh, are, uh, as I say, maybe impacting positively positively the FDA flow, but some are impacting negatively. And in the short term, and I would say that these are the measures that we are living, we are seeing more for the moment, are government measures to sustain liquidity, purchasing power and employment, and avoid bankruptcies, tax discount, cash of injection, concessional credit, merchant suspension, unemployment aid. There are other, uh, measures that are interesting because we have an investment promotion agency we webinar a couple of weeks ago and now we have a, a, a note on that but uh, there are a lot of investment facilitation measures right now like you know how to simplify how to after care these kind of stuff are here and i think that probably will stay here for a longer time but also some equity participation from the state uh, or a consideration of equity participation from the state Kind, I will not say nationalization because strong, sounds too, too strong, but some kind of a, a state participation, particularly in sectors that are important and strongly impacted like Erlang. We have seen that in Alitalia and not too much for the moment, but we know that government have these kind of measures uh, as part of, the, of, of, of their alternatives. And the last one that I think that is very important and has been increasing is protecting the strategic sectors using foreign uh, acquisition and uh, uh, screening mechanisms. These different measures have had an impact on international investment flow and disrupts supply chains. In addition, uh, the pandemic situation evolved and government need to adjust this kind of uh, Make measures and mechanisms. And I would say that this creates uncertainty. And uncertainty is something that normally is not very good for investment, but on the other hand, this is the situation that we are living right now. Um, as, as Loretta mentioned, we released a policy note on April 17. Uh, the things are changing so fast that we will update this and, and, and release another next week. And, but, and we identify 
three more than three, but I will. I want to present this uh, in, in this occasion. Three main important investment policies that are behind these measures that are implemented. First, as I told you, is the uh, the mechanism to address essential security interest. It's important to, under, to, to know that before and independent of the current crisis, many countries already had this mechanism to protect their essential security interests against threat associated with acquisition of certain uh, sensitive assets. This is something that we have been following the OECD for many years, uh, and, and, and we will release a, a full report uh, at the end of the month. But in the last two years, we were starting to follow that new, me these mechanisms were starting to be adjusted for many important countries because new threats that were not considered in the past were emerging, like digital threat, and also the presence of new foreign investors that were not considered before. In the current scenario of the COVID, uh, there, is a further, uh, there are further incentives uh, for countries to consider this mechanism and add to the growing interest in these policy areas in the past. And, and, and this is something that is important. I mean, these mechanisms exist before, were reforming in the last two years, but in this COVID, new impetu or new also threat, like the health issue that were not considered before, are starting to, to emerge. As suggested by example for the European Union, who released, uh, released uh, guidelines uh, at the end of March, this mechanism may play a particular role under the current market condition where price disruptions and economic stress may make sensitive assets more easy to access to potential pro problematic investors. Okay, that means that this exists, but this is a new threat that was not two, three, four months ago. Australia, Italy, Japan, Germany, Canada, Spain, and now New Zealand, two, two days ago, have already temporarily adjusted their in instrument in this area to be able to respond to this new scenario. Other countries like India has also implemented measures in this area. Government measures should strike the right balance between open foreign investment and the pursuit of essential security objectives, because this is a period where economies need foreign direct investment and review mechanisms can increase uncertainty, cost, and delay transaction. In this context, it's super important that policy design and implementation of these mechanisms are well done. And uh, we have guidance because uh, we have been working on that uh, before, and then these mechanisms need to at least fulfill some kind of principle of non-discrimination, transparency, predictability, proportionality, and accountability. And uh, it, it, this is important to keep the balance. The second policy area that I want to talk is about a trade and investment policy in the context of GBC, global value chain. You, we know that trade and investment flows are important to ensure efficient supply chains of goods and services, in particular to fight in the pandemic pharmaceutical, medical supplies and equipment, and increasing healthcare provision depends a lot on global value chains. In addressing this uh, medical supply shortage, government have leveraged investors network and investment promotion agency have been working with current multinational in their countries to, uh, uh, to see how they can um, change their, pro chip their production toward this uh, essential healthcare goods and services, but also extraordinary restrictive measures to address health crises have emerged. And I mentioned at the beginning, this export restriction is 70 countries is, uh, is huge. Trade ministerials at the G20 have said, you can implement this measure, but be target, be temporary and transparency. And I think that these are uh, basic principles also because we know that uh, immediate urgency at home are sometimes at odds with global objective of smooth functioning of global value chain. The last policy area that I want to mention and is the most important for this uh, conference is, uh, uh, is the issue of investment treaties. As I explained at the beginning, measures taken by governments to protect their societies and economies during the pandemic have profound effect on companies and investors. On the, go on the one hand, countries need more investment and in this context adequate protection is, 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 is 
important element in, in investment decision, but on the other hand, investment treaty design and interpretation can affect the policy space that government have. There are more than 3,000 investment protection treaties, many of them negotiated in the 90s, uh, and these treaties that prohibit discrimination and uncompensated appropriation uh, are sometimes with not too many clarification in the past. Modern agreements have more clear rules about this kind of stuff, and even some of them include what is understanding by in indirect expropriation. Um, uh, and also in the past, but also now, there are many agreements that have this kind of measures like fair and equitable treatment to cover investment and investment, and, and such provision which apply discriminatory measure and, and the most basic of investment claims under the treaties are subject to widely and varying approach of interpretation that leaves different impact in the policy space uh, for government. Claims related to crisis measure may test whether certain investment treaties strike the right balance between covering investor protection and government right to regulate. Uh, investment treaties should protect investment, uh, but at the same time should allow government to respond effectively uh, in this kind of, of crisis. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of cases, but I think that if dispute state cases start to surge, uh, maybe investment policymakers could be interested in taking some actions to clarify and ensure government policy space. In the medium term, the experience uh, may shape how government view treaty provisions. Um, the experience, uh, I think that we have been, been in a mood of reform. We have this uh, negotiation at the UNCI trial on investor state to settlement, and in the OECD also we have been discussing about reforms of treaties before this crisis. But uh, maybe this crisis and the circumstances that we are living could prompt government to make necessary adjustment and reform. Finally, my final remark, I, I think that is to say that the huge impact of the pandemic on society and economies around the world present an important juncture of the investment policy community to consider the, path, the approaches that we have had in the past. Key consideration should be how investment can contribute to greater resilience, but also how different institutions and policies needed to address the present problem that we have in a way that investment, international investment should be an element to uh, create a more inclu inclusive and sustainable society. And I think that uh, uh, right now governments are addressing these urgent needs uh, that, that we have because uh, they need to react, but very soon, I hope, they will start to see how we can recover. Uh, it's not clear when we will start, but I think that we need to start thinking about and principles of openness, transparency, fairness, inclusivity, sustainability are important during the crisis and should be important in the recovery process. These are my interventions, Loreto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And I, and I think and I would like to hope that this crisis would also provide an opportunity for renewed importance in international organizations and multilateralism. And we probably will have a positive effect, at least one, of this crisis. But I think this sets the stage very well for Janssen Kalamita, who is the head of investment law and policy at CIL, to contribute with his remarks on the investment treaty protection issues that are raised by COVID-19 and related measures. And I think he can discuss how international investment treaties apply to the measures taken uh, where both states and investors are operating in this very uncertain environment, as Anna has stressed. And I think he can also address the impact of the current measures and the crisis on the regime of investment treaties as a whole and the eventuality that uh, new and massive investment claims may arise as a result of this pandemic, not unlike what happened in Argentina following the currency crisis in the early 2000s or uh, what happened with the claims that a number of countries faced uh, regarding the renewable energy cases. So here's to you, Janssen, for your presentation. Hi, Loretta. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to look at the, uh, the issues that are raised by the interface between uh, investment treaties and the current pandemic. Um, and I want to do that in, in three different ways. 
the first is doctrinal. Um, how do investment treaties apply to the measures that states are taking during the pandemic? Uh, and I think the short answer is um, not very predictably. Um, as Anna has said, um, over the past several months, states have adopted a wide range of measures uh, in an attempt to address the pandemic. Um, and those measures have had a tremendous effect on economic activity um, around the world. And of course, they're affecting everyone, including, among others, uh, foreign investors. So the question to first address is, is how these measures apply, sorry, how these treaties apply to these measures and whether the measures that states are taking are likely to give rise to claims under these treaties. And here I think the answer is clearly yes, uh, they are likely to give rise to claims, um, but it's impossible to tell at this point whether those claims are likely to be successful. Um, and that's partly due to the way in which investment treaties are drafted, as Anna mentioned, um, and partly due to the issues that investment treaties are asked to mediate, uh, namely the balance between the protection of private property on the one hand and the state's discretion to exercise its sovereign power um, on the other hand. Um, as Anna has mentioned, there are thousands of these treaties uh, currently in force around the world. Virtually every country is party to at least one, many are parties to dozens. Um, and while these are individual treaties um, with different wording and different provisions, they generally provide a similar core of protection, which for those in our audience who, who are not doing investment treaty law every day, um, may be worth to summarize briefly. Um, there is a protection against unlawful expropriation, um, either direct nationalization or indirect expropriation, encompassing a, a series of actions that have an equivalent to equivalence to a uh, direct taking. Uh, there's an obligation to provide fair and equitable treatment in most treaties, encompassing uh, obligation not to deny justice or to engage in arbitrary decision-making, which in itself encompasses a whole host of sub-issues, including procedural unfairness, lack of due process, bad faith, failure to protect legitimate expectations. Um, an obligation to provide reasonable diligence uh, with respect to physical security of investors and their investment, and an obligation not to discriminate um, in favor of foreign uh, home state investors or in favor of nationals of third states. And of course, they also contain the very potent remedy of investor state arbitration, allowing investors to exercise these rights to bring claims, um, which in cases can involve hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Um, so when these treaties are involved and when these standards are invoked, um, many issues are raised for investor state tribunals, but in many ways they're the kinds of issues that states optimally um, are considering when they're formulating their policies. But one can certainly not overestimate the difficult regulatory environment in which states are operating. Um, first question is simply, whether there is any kind of evidentiary basis for the measures that have been adopted. Uh, and this goes to the reasonableness or the potential arbitrariness of the measures. So here we see some states, particularly developed states, which are able to conduct their own scientific research with respect to COVID-19. Whereas other states may be relying upon the research and the evidence provided by, developed by other countries or by the WHO states or rather investment tribunals are likely to be called upon to ask whether the evidence that states are relying upon supports the measures that they're adopting. The second question is what's the duration of the measures that are being implemented and are they subject to review? So not only does the measure have to be reasonable, uh, has to have, not only does there have to be a reasonable basis for the measure itself, but there needs to be a reasonable basis for the timing of the measure and their duration. So it's important that there's a process of review so that these measures can be assessed for ongoing suitability as conditions change over time. And here we already see in many countries ongoing debates as to the duration of lockdowns, social distancing, and so forth. Third question is whether the measures are proportionate benefits of public health on the one hand 
and the costs and impact on private rights in the other. And this again goes to the, the issue of arbitrariness of the measures. And there, there's a wide body of case law in which tribunals have looked at the proportionality of state measures, including in cases involving public health. And I think what one finds when you look at that case law is that A, most tribunals are generally willing to provide states with deference to varying degrees in the review of their decisions. Um, two, but there are, uh, there are tribunals, and more to the point, there are arbitrators um, who are quite willing to second guess the reasonableness of state measures, whether taken for public health or other reasons. And this leads to a situation in which the outcome of future cases is going to depend not only upon the facts of those cases, but very much upon the way in which those tribunals are composed and who is sitting on them. A fourth question is whether the measures undermine or contradict assurances that officials from the state might have given to investors or individual, uh, uh, either in a particular sector or under a particular law. Um, investors aren't entitled to expect that the law will never change during the course of their uh, investment, especially not during a crisis. But that said, if the government has taken actions that create a legitimate expectation that the law is not going to change or that will change only according to certain procedures, um, then that may give rise to claims if the state later acts differently. And this is especially true if the state has made specific representations to investors um, as was a feature of many of the Argentinian cases. Um, do the inv measures impact investors unequally? Do they discriminate in law or in fact? Um, discrimination on the basis of nationality is prohibited not only when it's de jure discrimination, but also when it's de facto discrimination. Um, that said, if the state can present legitimate non-discriminatory rationale for the measures, then discriminatory impact alone is not going to be enough to make out a claim, or at least it shouldn't. Um, the sixth question is whether the powers that the state is exercising uh, in taking these measures are lawful as a matter of its domestic law. Um, ultimately, regardless of the reasons for which the measures are being taken, it's important that the government has the legal authority to take those measures and that this authority is used for the purpose that it was given. If that's not the case, then you have the potential of arguments concerning the ultra vires um, use of power or the abuse of power. And in this regard, um, you might have seen yesterday the Wisconsin Supreme Court in the United States uh, ruled against the governor of that state, finding that he had acted beyond his authority by extending the state's lockdown of businesses. Um, lastly, just with respect to expropriation, um, Questions arise in those cases principally with respect to uh, compensation. Investment treaties require compensation in cases of expropriation, and it's usually market value compensation. So tribunals are likely to ask whether in regulations calling for the requisition of factories or the taking of property, whether or not there's compensation provided, how the compensation is calculated, uh, and whether the compensation is equally available to nationals as well as to protected foreign investors. So in some treaties on the doctrinal side still, there are carve-out clauses which exempt measures for the protection of public health, sometimes specifically for public health, sometimes public health among other public purposes. Um, these treaties tend to be more recent treaties, and they also are relatively few and far between in the great thousands of treaties that are currently in force. Um, some of them apply to all the protections in the treaty. Some of them may provide, pro apply simply to some of the protections in the treaty, such as, for example, national treatment. Um, with states with provisions like this in this treaty, they may be able to raise particular lines of defense that the treaties ought not to apply to particular measures, although here there's been very little testing in litigation as to the scope and the application of these treaties. Beyond these treaty exceptions, which are relatively rare, there are certain doctrines in customary international law that provide states with narrow defenses um, to claim uh, for breach of international obligations, 
the doctrine of necessity, of course, being perhaps the most, most well known and the one upon which Argentina tried to rely in many of the cases that it faced in the early 2000s that Loretta mentioned. As is known, those were not successful efforts by and large um, with tribunals imposing stiff requirements on Argentina to demonstrate that the measures that it had taken had been the only way to address the crisis and that it showed that it had not contributed to the conditions bringing about the crisis and the state of necessity. So in this regard, query whether certain states might be said to have contributed to the extent of the, certain, of the current crisis by failing to act sooner with regard to testing, stockpiling equipment, and so forth. That's the doctrinal lay of the land as, as far as I see it. Looking apart from doctrine, looking more predictively or in terms of recommendations, um, what I think are the near-term prospects for disputes under these treaties and, and whether there's anything that states investors can do to avoid them. I mean, first of all, I think there is a potential for large numbers of cases against individual states. And there's the risk that certain states become claims magnets. And we've seen this before with, for example, Argentina, the renewable energies cases that you mentioned, Loretta, um, as well as um, cases against Egypt and other Middle Eastern countries in the aftermath of of the Arab Spring. If that multiplies on a wide scale or globally, and here every state is going through the same crisis, essentially, and adopting measures that are disruptive to the economy in a variety of ways, then I don't think it's unreasonable to be concerned that there will be claims. Um, this is not going to happen overnight, um, but it is certainly a possibility. And again, the situation is an uncertain one, and we don't know how long it will last and where it will go in the future. Nevertheless, I think that clearly cautions in favor of states trying to do what they can to avoid claims. And similarly for investors for whom claims are uh, not in their interest either. I mean, the most obvious for states is of course good regulatory practice. Uh, but that's of course also the most challenging for many states, um, particularly in the exceedingly difficult regulatory circumstances where you we find ourselves in with lack of information, condensed time frames, and so forth. But the other aspect is one that Anna mentioned in, in her remarks, and that's investment aftercare. Um, and this is an area that I think is frequently overlooked in discussions of investment treaties. But one of the lessons of prior crises is that it can be key. So if you look at the, Argent at the situation in Argentina in the 2000s, um, in those relationships between the state and investors, where there was a breakdown of trust, where there was a, a breakdown in communication, um, that precipitated claims. And those ended up precipitating investors leaving the market of Argentina altogether. In other situations, however, with other investors who were similarly affected by Argentina's measures, um, where the parties were able to keep lines of communication open, act cooperatively, then tame claims tended to be avoided and long-term uh, investment relationships salvaged. Um, in terms of international solutions, there have been a number proposed, um, but honestly, as, as I read them so far, I, I struggle to see the feasibility and effectiveness. Um, the first is a global moratorium uh, proposed by Jeffrey Sachs, among others, um, in the nature of a multilateral declaration or agreement suspending the filing of ISDS claims. And I think whatever one might think of this suggestion, it seems eminently unfeasible. Um, one, I doubt whether there is significant support among states for such a radical proposal. Um, and even whether with support, um, the amount of time that it would take to conclude such a multilateral instrument um, would be fast enough and sufficient enough to address the current crisis. Um, now scaling back on Sachs's proposal, I think what one could imagine, perhaps, um, are interpretive statements, perhaps multilateral, perhaps plurilateral interpretive statements as to the meaning of key provisions in some of these older treaties, like FET or other protections. Um, that's less radical, yet still takes a significant degree of time and effort to coordinate and agree. Uh, and lastly, there's been a suggestion by some academics that um, 
states could unilaterally withdraw their consent to arbitration under IIAs. And the idea here seems to be that because IIAs contain offers to arbitrate, and there is no agreement to arbitrate until the investor accepts that offer by filing its claim, uh, that this would be a possible route for states. Um, personally, I think it's highly problematic. Um, I think doctrinally, the offers in IIAs are not unilateral offers, but they're a bilateral agreement to offer arbitration, and the state can't withdraw what it's agreed bilaterally, uh, unilaterally, unless the treaty otherwise allows and investment treaties don't allow that. Um, now, just finally, looking at the long view um, of the pandemic and its possible impact on the investment regime in a whole, um, there's that saying that uh, one should never let a good crisis go to waste. And, and indeed, I think whereas the pandemic poses challenges, it also provides some opportunities perhaps for reform of the current regime, um, an issue that is a priority for many states. Um, what it does in the first instance, and I think, is, is it's likely to place real further pressure on the current ISDS system. Uh, when cases concerning measures taken uh, to combat the pandemic are brought, not only will states be on trial, but the whole ISDS system will be on as well. Um, and this feeds into ongoing reform discussions in UNCTRAL, uh, about the establishment of a multilateral investment court, and I think it probably strengthens moves uh, in that direction. Um, I also may give impetus to consideration of systemic multilateral reform of the substantive content of IIAs, something that's been off the table for years. Um, and again, it also reinforces for states the vulnerability that they have as long as they keep these older treaties in their portfolios. And finally, perhaps, if nothing else, it suggests that the way in which public health is treated in investment treaties uh, may need to be modernized and reconsidered, whether by way of carve-outs or by way of specialized uh, dispute settlement procedures in the same way that there are gatekeeper procedures uh, similar for tax measures or for financial services. So thanks very much, Loretta. I'm sure that was more than 15 minutes. My apologies. It's quite all right. We're quite happy to have listened to you for even more than 15 minutes. It was barely more. And, uh, but I think this sets very nicely the stage for Sylvie, who is the General Counsel and Director of Canada's Trade Law Bureau, to provide us with the perspective of a government uh, which is trying to deal with these issues and deals with these issues in real time in a fast moving crisis and to try and achieve a very delicate balance between the different interests and rights involved, which uh, Janssen has already touched on. So, Sylvie, you have the floor. For law, um, in order to, to have invited me to speak today at this webinar, um, what I propose uh, to do is uh, to provide you a short overview of Canada's measures in response to the crisis uh, and Canada's approach in determining its policy response. Um, and then I can quickly talk about our BIT obligations in, in our treaties and some thoughts as to whether governments should have concerns about ISDS cases arising from their COVID-19 measures. Um, so how have we responded to the crisis? Well, we have, as many governments, uh, adopted an array of different measures. Some of them include uh, restrictions on business op operations for our, from the various stay-at-home orders, the um, economic and financial support to help individuals, businesses, and sectors of, affected by COVID-19. So that was in our economic response plan, and it includes things like tax deferral, subsidies, financial assistance uh, for individual businesses and sectors. In addition, uh, there have been some pretty extensive, as with many countries, uh, travel restrictions and uh, for everything except essential travel. Uh, and it's, it's quite extraordinary uh, that the Canada-US border that hadn't been closed in hundreds of years uh, was temporarily closed to all non-essential discretionary travel. 
but that nevertheless, the government recognized at the same time that there had to be continued global movement of goods and people and uh, ongoing delivery of essential services. And so therefore the, the border was allowed uh, for certain trade shipments uh, to continue to move back and forth. Uh, as some of you may know, I think some of the points between the Canada US border see more tracks and, tr and trucks and trade than anywhere else in the world in a, in a given day. Um, in addition to that, there have been a number of uh, financial incentives uh, to advance research and development and fast tracking uh, clinical trials for vaccines and tests. But Kenta has stayed away from adopting export restrictions as some countries have on the uh, uh, PPEs or on drugs, uh, as well as uh, refraining from uh, restrictions on food products. Um, there have been some prudential measures by financial regulators. Uh, and as Anna mentioned, uh, the Canadian government uh, on the investment front uh, published a policy statement on foreign investment review and COVID-19, which announced essentially enhanced scrutiny of foreign direct investment of any value uh, in Canadian businesses that are related to public health or critical goods and services. Um, and the measure was, as, as the policy statement refers to, it's meant to deal with uh, opportunistic investment behaviors uh, that are caused by the sharp decline in valuations of Canadian businesses uh, triggered by the economic crisis, uh, as well as some of the investment by state-owned enterprises that may not be commercially motivated and cause national security risks. Now, the new policy, applies in the context of reviews already contemplated under Canada's Investment Canada Act. Uh, so it's not a new legislation. And it, 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 it does apply temporarily until the economic recovery from COVID, from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, how have these measures been put in place? Um, it, because of the SARS outbreak in 2003, Canada had already emergency uh, preparedness plans for pandemics and some legislation like the Quarantine Act to allow for a prompt response to this kind of health crisis. But we nevertheless had to pass two emergency legislations, uh, as well as a number of regulations and orders, a number of them temporary, for example, to authorize and make effective uh, certain travel and, and border restrictions. Because of the urgency, as, as Jans referred to, the usual legislative and regulatory process had to be shortened. Uh, and of course, consultation in this situation had to be a little limited. Um, however, to the extent possible, the usually policy development process that we follow uh, was respected, including assessment of legal implications, both domestically and international, uh, uh, under our international treaties. Now, let me just briefly cover the kind of principles that guided Canada's approach uh, to uh, response to the crisis. Um, first of all, collaboration with government and stakeholders, uh, given that this is a shared federal provincial responsibility. Um, second, evidence-based uh, decision-making. Uh, third, proportionality. Um, the has to respond to the appropriate level to the, the level of threat, basically. Uh, fourth, uh, flexibility, uh, the ability to change the measure and adapt it as new information becomes available. Um, and as well, uh, a precautionary approach so that the measures are timely and reasonable, but proportional to the threat and informed by uh, evidence to the extent possible. The legislative and regulatory measures that were taken uh, were also published, not only through the regular channels, but made available on a dedicated website. Um, and I, I think Canada and many countries have emphasized, uh, including in the context of WTO discussion, the importance of transparency regarding government measures. At the same time, in developing its response, uh, Canada recognized the importance of international coordination with other countries and international organizations. 
like the WHO and the WTO. And from a trade and investment perspective, the focus has been to avoid the disruption to the global supply chain and maintaining a stable trade and investment environment, of course, to the extent possible, uh, as well as an avoid, avoiding unnecessary interference and restrictions on trade and investment. Um, with, um, as Anna referred to, Canada with other G20 countries uh, issued a ministerial statement on March 30th stressing that uh, emergency measures uh, designed to tackle COVID-19, if deemed necessary, must be targeted, proportionate, transparent, and temporary, and not create unnecessary barriers to trade or disruption to global chains. Um, and, and in addition, it has signed a declaration with uh, WTO members um, to enforce its commitment for and support for a rule-based multilateral uh, system at this critical time. Uh, and in it, it pledged to refer, refrain from raising unjustified barriers to investment or trade in goods and services. Now, our legislative and executive actions in response to the crisis are of course limited by domestic law. Even during a state of emergency, Charter of Rights and constitutional considerations constrain the government's emergency powers, the ministerial discretion, and are subject to judicial review by domestic courts. And of course, in addition to domestic law, uh, as I referred to earlier, uh, there are treaty obligations. Now, it is important to draw a distinction between what is good public policy and the various statements that Canada has made internationally in terms of what's desirable goals and uh, what, what it is pursuing um, and what the obligations that states have actually committed to in their investment treaties. Um, and certainly our BITs uh, were never designed to undermine the legitimate regulatory function of the state, especially in uh, emergency situations. Properly interpreted, in other words, the treaty protections uh, that we agree to should not affect Canada's ability to take measures or uh, require payment of compensation. Now, the right to regulate, this right to regulate is explicitly uh, recognized in a number of Canada's treaties, including through the language in the preamble and sometimes explicitly in articles and provisions like in CETA. Uh, but in addition, I think the various statements that governments have made on uh, the right to regulate and uh, their ability to respond to the crisis, whether in uh, treaties or in international statements, should guide ISDS tribunals. Um, Jans has uh, gone through a number of the substantive obligations in treaties. Um, I, I won't go through them again, but when properly interpreted, again, I think Canvas treaties are perhaps a little bit more uh, precisely drafted than some of the uh, older uh, generation treaties that many countries have, um, and have certainly uh, post NAFTA included a number of clarifications like on indirect expropriation uh, and the content of the minimum standard of treatment. Uh, certainly, and, and maybe I can just res respond to a, a comment that Jans has made um, that, you know, governments should try to act in the uh, proportional uh, and that tribunal will review the reasonableness of the measure. Uh, certainly, uh, Canada has stated uh, on numerous occasion, uh, and uh, I think the NAFTA parties consistently stated that uh, reasonableness and proportionality uh, are not part of the assessment uh, that ISDS tribunal are empowered uh, to, to make in the context of uh, uh, FET or MST. It, in other words, it doesn't open the door for tribunals to evaluate whether the government's response was the right or the best measure. And of course, governments have had, at the time when they're taking these measures, they have limited information, they need to take urgent action. Um, so having tribunals consider that uh, with hindsight would be highly inappropriate. And uh, as we heard, many countries have taken different measures, different approaches 
uh, not all are the same and it was hard uh, to know at the time or uh, and it will be hard to know for a number of months perhaps uh, which approach was right. Um, finally, uh, just uh, to uh, echo uh, what uh, Anna was saying about new foreign investment screening mechanisms that have been introduced. Um, Canada and its treaties actually protects uh, and always uh, its ability to uh, review foreign investments under its Investment Canada Act uh, in all of its treaties. Um, uh, and so, uh, however, whether and to what extent other governments uh, have that ability under their treaties uh, depends on uh, each case. Now, uh, beyond the question of consistency of the existing measures uh, taken by government, I think it will be important for governments to monitor the situation and develop an exit strategy, um, and it, including considerations of when uh, to put an end uh, to certain temporary measures and ensuring that the withdrawal of certain measures itself is not done, done in a way that uh, will give rise to potential claim. Now, let me uh, just briefly touch about whether, uh, to touch on the point of, you know, should governments be concerned of uh, this explosion of ISDS cases? Uh, of course, there's always risks given the amounts at issue and the impact of these measures that there will be both domestic and international uh, litigation. Um, and I think up to date, the, the focus of government's actions and consideration has been responding to the crisis and on international collaboration to avoid investment barriers and not thinking about theoretical claims that may come down the line. Now, without minimizing the risk, I don't believe there will be an explosion of claims uh, coming arising from the current context from good faith measures by governments uh, in response to it. Um, but of course, it can't be excluded. Um, in my personal view, the ability of investors to establish damages in a but for scenario, so but for the government intervention at a time where all governments around the world are intervening in the economy and imposing their own sets of measure, uh, would be extremely speculative. Uh, but the possibility itself of facing claims raises concerns. No government wants to be defending claims in the middle of pandemic where the government capacity uh, is limited and resources are scarce, uh, not to mention the strain on the public purse. And uh, the optics of giving priority to compensation to foreign investor over domestic investors that were similarly negatively affected is certainly not one that was intended by Canada. Um, domestically, there have been calls in some countries to protect businesses from litigation related to COVID-19. Uh, for example, as the economy uh, reopens, businesses are concerns about, concerned about their liability to their employees, to customers. Well, similarly, as Jans mentioned, internationally, there have been calls about suspending ISDS uh, during or in relation to measures uh, taken to respond to the pandemic. It is worth considering uh, to avoid unjustified claims against good faith measures. Um, of course, each government has to consider the risk related to the, their own BIT obligations or to an incorrect or expensive interpretation of the obligations or simply to the cost of defending ISDS claims. Um, and they have to weigh that against the risk that this would prevent legitimate claims, for example, in cases of expropriation without compensation or abusive or protectionist measures that are imposed under the guise of COVID-19 but are designed uh, to, to do something completely different. Um, and I will end my comments uh, on that, but I'm, I would be happy to answer any uh, further questions there may be on uh, these, uh, some of these ideas that are floating around. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you very much, Sylvie. That was extremely interesting and uh, a lot of food for thought. And perhaps we'll come back to some of the issues you touched on in the question and answer phase and maybe Ramesh will be able to address some of them. I just note that the Canada-EU Canada -EU trade agreement, the CETA, does specify that non-discriminatory regulatory measures 
designed to uh, protect legitimate public welfare objectives, including therefore public health, do not constitute indirect expropriation. Therefore, I think, except in rare circumstances. So that may protect states from indirect expropriation claims, but, uh, but it may not assist in relation to other breaches of uh, other provisions of investment treaties. There are more recent uh, uh, treaties like the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement that specifically refer to legitimate public welfare objectives of public health that shall not be the subject of a claim. But perhaps that would give some material for other treaties, for other negotiations of, uh, of treaties by states, because obviously these, these kind of treaties will prevent um, investment treaty claims concerning COVID-19 altogether. But I will not take more time for our last by, uh, by no means least speaker, Ramesh Viramantri, who is the head of the International Dispute Resolution uh, Group at TIL, and is counsel at Clifford Chance in Singapore. And he's gonna wear the second hat tonight to uh, talk about the challenges for dispute settlement procedures posed by COVID-19, such as questions of procedure, but also the practice of investment arbitration that states and investors and arbitral institutions and arbitrators are facing in an attempt to resolve disputes uh, during the pandemic, including the implications for dispute resolution, uh, settlement uh, and settlement once the pandemic is over. How many of these new practicing that we're living through these days will survive the pandemic, assuming that we all will survive the pandemic? Ramesh, to you. Thank you, Loretta. Um, as I'm starting to speak, there, there is a large thunderstorm that's passing over my apartment block in Singapore. So uh, if you hear like thunder when I'm speaking, it's not what I've actually, it's highly unlikely it's due to what I've been saying. Uh, it's not a NUS CIL sound effect. It's a, an act of God, um, just like the pandemic. So just, uh, just a warning about that. Um, I'd like to speak on three different topics, as, as Loretta briefly uh, noted. Uh, first is ch the challenges for dispute settlement during the crisis. The second is, well, once the crisis is over, what these procedural changes, will, will they survive? Um, what will survive? And third, uh, with some time, I'd like to speak about some examples of potential investment claims, but very generally. Um, now, to be begin, with, begin with, as a general introduction, and I think Anna said this quite eloquently, there is this delicate balance in the investment treaty framework between what the investors need and what, the, what governments need. So obviously, investors need protection and governments need investment. That's the balance. Um, and that the trade-off between these two concepts really is what underlies uh, the investment treaty system. And <clears throat> what we're seeing at the moment is just the type of situation where we need investment treaties. You have, as Anna mentioned, a 30% decrease for, uh, potentially in FDI that means that the supply of FDI has, has decreased. So this sort of the supply and demand um, factors are going to be accentuated. And if governments want investment, they're going to have to compete much more now for uh, FDI uh, with this 30% decrease. So <clears throat> as part of that equation, investment treaties, again, could start being quite important for investors. Now, from my perspective as, a, you know, at Clifford Chance, we, we do more and more advice work to clients coming and saying, you know, what, what's a BIT? What's ICSID? What's this system? Fif 10 years ago, um, you, you would talk to clients about BITs and they'd say, what are you talking about? And, and you know, you wouldn't really have any, any sort of ear from a client. But these days, clients are becoming more sophisticated. They're understanding the system. So <clears throat> it's a delayed process. I, I, I would admit 10 years ago, parties really didn't know too much about BITs. 
but now it's becoming quite well known. Um, and so it does play an important part in this balance. You know, and, and clients will start saying, and investors, they're going to invest millions and millions of dollars into a country. They're going to start thinking about the protections and, and, the, and, and, and basically trying to see how they can reduce the risk that their investment uh, uh, has once they make it into a country. So that's where I think investment treaties will become much more important in this context of the, the COVID measures that have been taken around the world. Now, in terms, terms of the more practical challenges to dispute settlements at the moment, there, there are many, many different levels uh, that uh, COVID is, is ra raising challenges to the traditional dispute resolution processes. The first, and this is on everybody's mind, is, well, you, you, you cannot travel, people cannot meet in person. So what happens to the traditional in-person hearing uh, once you get to that stage of the dispute resolution process? And the answer is, well, have a virtual hearing via, via Zoom, via all of these new technologies and platforms that we have. That's all well and good, but there are issues. That, there are security issues, obviously. Um, connectivity. So if you're dealing with a state that, that you know, does not have the, the right infrastructure, potentially there's connectivity problems. And when you have these virtual hearings, especially in the investment treaty context, you're talking about a global link up. And that's, that's one of the problems, one of the practical problems that we're having at the moment. So there's a case I'm working on at the moment. So there's counsel from uh, um, uh, Australia, Singapore, Europe, and, and it's an exit case. So you've got the secretariat in Washington. So how do you actually, you know, a stage or organize a, a hearing for a whole day when all of these dis, you know, people are around the world are trying to stay up through the night, potentially. Um, so that's where virtual hearings uh, have an issue. I, I think you can't just have a full day hearing with a global link up. It's gonna be very difficult. Um, so potentially, and, and one of the options that I've seen is that you're breaking down hearings into not full days, but say a three hour block on one day and having another day, another three hour block. Um, so <clears throat> those are very practical problems. In terms of the, uh, the, the uh, procedures that go on in the hearing, you know, for, for example, everyone used to talk about cross-examination being something that you really need to be present at and in person, you need to see that witness sweat you know, you need to see him tremble. Um, all of those sorts of concepts need to be reassessed. Um, now, you know, does, does cross-examination over, over a video system, will that serve the same purpose? And I think over the course of time, people will, will need to learn how to do that. And, and, and arbitrators need to learn how to, you know, uh, assess witnesses through a virtual scenario or a virtual... Uh, platform. Um, there have been lots of, and uh, again, I've been um, in, a, in a case where we've had a plea, not a pleading, a, a submission to the tribunal of dozens of, no, yeah, it was, it was over, over 12 pages. It was, bought, and it's basically, it was saying that the ability to be in the same room with the people, right, if that's not given to one of the parties, there's a denial of justice there. Um, and there was, there was, it was a very sort of, well, uh, uh, what, I wouldn't, I, I don't think it was strong in my opinion, but it was strong for that, that party. They felt very strongly about it being present in the hearing. Now that brings another issue up if you want to talk with the other side, if you want to mediate, if you want to settle your case, you know, what happens with that personal interaction that you have when you're in a hearing or when you're in the corridor, you talk to these people, you have all of these sorts of extra, if, you, if you'd like to say, extracurricular interactions with parties. 
that you have hearings that you don't have over your virtual hearing. Um, and sometimes that helps sort of clear the air, that helps sort of uh, lower the tensions when you're having coffee and, and then you talk to somebody from the other side. You know, those sorts of personal details are not there when you have virtual hearings. But again, I think we're still stuck with virtual hearings and we need to work out how to deal with this. Um, <clears throat> the other point that I'd like to raise is um, you've got the, the, the hearings, because virtual hearings are going to to be like this for you know for the in the in the near future in the mid to near future um, you you have this issue about well okay potentially hearings may uh, uh, the length of hearings may diminish okay and if that's the case and that's that's a likely option what happens to the pleadings and and then there are certain people who say well the pleadings the written document submissions will start to gain greater and greater importance. So there might be more of a focus now on the written documentation rather than the final hearing where everything, you know, potentially might get resolved. And, and so there's going to be a greater emphasis on the written pleadings, potentially they could increase. Um, uh, and then you, you'll have this sort of uh, uh, issue about the explosion of paper, uh, which is sort of quite ironic when we're using technology uh, uh, in this way. So that's, a, that's another factor. And the third factor, and it's probably the most contentious um, point that I'm going to raise is um, the use of litigation funders, and especially in this environment where companies don't really have the, the, the ability to spend. Uh, I think they're going to look more and more towards litigation funders. Uh, and, and that issue, I think, will uh, uh, gain the spotlight uh, much more than it did before. <clears throat> in terms of what happens when the pandemic is over, um, I think, as I indicated, I think that the virtual hearings uh, will be something that will be here to stay, not, not for everything, but council, arbitrators, parties, states, clients, will start to understand how this works. They'll get familiar with this virtual setup um, and they'll be more inclined to agree to that type of situation. Um, they'll be saving costs. We won't have to be getting on planes. We won't be spending money on expensive hotels. Um, all of those sorts of costs potentially could be removed. So there is, I think there is a long-term potential for virtual hearings, but they need to address uh, the, the issues that I mentioned before. Um, you know, the other thing is, well, <clears throat> even if you get back into the normal situation where you have in-person uh, types of uh, meetings and hearings, what's going? If there's no cure that's developed for uh, COVID-19 for, for the long in the long term, what's going to happen? What? How is a hearing going to actually? be conducted when you need social distancing, when potentially you have to have masks on uh, in the hearing. Um, you know, how is that going to affect the quality of the hearing? So potentially there are sorts of issues. And I think what we're learning now, and I think everybody, I think nobody's really uh, 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 going to get an A grade in this. Um, everyone's learning, everyone's working out what's best. Um, and the le lessons we learn now, I think, will, will be very important for the post-COVID COVID world. Now, finally, I'd just like to sort of touch upon some examples of potential claims that, that could be made, just to give some, maybe a, a, a factual grounding for uh, potentially a discussion that may happen after this. Um, we've heard there have been <coughs> reports from Peru saying investors potentially may start thinking about claims against the Peruvian government for the, suspens the suspension of ro road tolls. So the, the government there uh, suspended road tolls for a period. And so the, the, the parties involved in the, the building of the, the road, the highways or, or who are uh, uh, operating the road toll system potentially could be in, uh, affected. And there, there, there are, uh, there's talk about claims uh, from them against the government of Peru. 
Uh, obviously, you've got the the um, the oft often talked about issue about medical supplies, you know, compulsory acquisition of them, or the government directing them to be sent uh, to another country, whatever. But but again, interference in uh, medical supplies or other types of goods that would be very valuable to treat or may, uh, uh, prevent uh, the, the virus. <clears throat> Hotel requisitions. So governments, you know, using hotels to, to actually uh, 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 use for, for patients uh, or quarantine uh, 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 potential patients. So again, that raises these issues about all well, the owners of the hotel, what do they get and how much compensation do they get? Um, uh, <clears throat> discriminatory aid, uh, you know, what is an essential service? It could the, potentially, is the definition of a potential service something that will help the local industry rather than a, a foreign investors? Um, uh, and this is an interesting one because I read this in the BBC. There was a, a case in Africa where there was a, a vi apparently, and I'm just, just uh, this is my rec recollection of, of the story. Um, there was a virus in a hotel in Africa and the measure there that was imposed was to destroy the hotel or destroy part of the hotel where the virus was. So again, you know, you've got these sorts of you know, COVID-related uh, 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 measures potentially that could could lead to investment claims. Um, the, the, and finally, the one the the claim type that I think is very interesting is what happens if you have, say, for example, a factory, and you say. I don't want that factory opened because I want to actually limit my workers getting COVID or I want to limit the spread. But the government says, no, you must open that factory. And to me, that's a very interesting sort of reversal of the, you know, you know, these sorts of scenarios where you are saying, no, no, I want to protect my workers. I want to protect the factory. But the government says, no, no, we need to open up business. We're going to open up this factory. We're going to forcefully require you to, to, to produce goods through that factory, potentially. Uh, you know, what, what, what are the implications there for uh, uh, investment claims? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, they're sort of general. And all of these are speculative. All of these will have to go through procedures uh, uh, if they're bought. I, and as, I, as Sylvie said, I don't think that there will be mass claims, you know, and, and tribunals these days will be very receptive to what's, what government needs, what government uh, concerns are in this COVID world. Um, and it, it, it will be, I think, very difficult to just have a scattershot attempt at a claim. So... With that in mind, I, I think that we are facing extraordinary times, but I hope that investment treaties aren't abused by investors, but I also hope investment treaties aren't abused by states who try to hide behind, you know, to try to evade their obligations under the investment treaties. Um, but that's the sort of the, globe, the, the, the framework from an investor's perspective. Um, and... Uh, I think that, you know, I'm very happy to have a further discussion on the, the issues that I've raised. So I'll hand you back to Loretta. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. This was very helpful and very interesting. I have not personally, as an arbitrator, yet had the experience of a virtual hearing. Uh, my cases are all being somewhat postponed at the moment. So things are going to happen later on and we'll see what happens. But I wanted to make a little comment before uh, I give the floor to uh, Anna, who had also a reaction to what she said. From the perspective of the arbitrator, I think there are a number of also very interesting issues that we're going to be confronted with. And you mentioned the fact that there may be a situation where a party does not want to have a hearing, insists that if you have a virtual hearing, 
its rights will be affected and due process may be affected. So it's a question of, you know, if one party pushes for a hearing, the other one does not, or in fact opposes the idea, it's a difficult position that the arbitrators are put in because they're going to have to, uh, you know, decide issues that potentially affect the equal treatment of the parties. And, and I'm wondering as a civil lawyer, does this mean the end of oral submissions altogether? Are we going to go back to, a, you know, just written proceedings um, as some, some probably civil law judges would, uh, who had turned into arbitrators would prefer to have anyways. On the other hand, I can understand the issues that are raised when you have a long hearing, two week hearings, as often you have in these large investment cases with many witnesses with experts who have to be hot tubbed. How do you handle all of that? How does counsel prepare? How do team get, teams get together and, and deal with all the document uh, preparations, the bundles that have to be submitted to the tribunal? How do you deal with live recording, live notes? If you're an arbitrator with one screen in front of you, how does that happen in practice? So there are many issues that we all have to work around. And you said uh, that uh, we, we will and, uh, because we have to. Uh, I note also uh, from the perspective of the arbitrator, the deliberations online are not the same thing. And that I have done. And that is also unfortunate because you do miss that human aspect, that interaction. And it doesn't work the same way. Somehow something is missing that human element does not really come across uh, through the screen. But Anna, you had, you had a comment. So let me give the floor to you before I give the floor to our participants for questions. Yeah, no, no, very, but thanks a lot. I think that's very interesting to listen all of you. Uh, but it's just the introduction part of promise because I want to clarify the dedicated balance, what I mean by the dedicated balance. For me, it's not just the need of protection and the and the investment need of, uh, of, of and the need of investment of the government is the need of protection and the right to regulate. And I and I will tell you why because I see that the need of ad, attraction of investment of government that because investment is an important element in the growth and all this kind of stuff is the need of protection. Protection is one element to attract investment, but then investment is one element to make sustainable development. And then how you combine this kind of attraction investment. And the right to regulate is important. And I think that it has been increasing in the importance in the last years. The public concern, public are more aware about these bilateral investment treaties and not always in the positive way because they see that, oh, these treaties are not allowing government to make positive impact. And then the, the idea is that how you make this investment that create a positive impact in society. And this is related with the investment protection with other kind of important objective that government have. I think that the combination of that is the balance that I was referring at the beginning. Just this clarification. Thank you very much. And I understand also that Sylvie has something to say. Sylvie. Yeah, no, just exactly on that point. In fact, um, you know, in CETA, for example, uh, we explicitly put in a provision not only dealing with indirect expropriation, the right to regulate, but also a specific reaffirmation uh, in Article uh, 8 9 of uh, the agreement, uh, where we reaffirm the right to regulate to achieve legitimate policy objectives, such as the protection of public health and safety. And of course, we haven't taken an exclusion uh, such as the one that you referred to that says you can't even bring it to a dispute. But is it, it's a, the idea is, is, is to provide a very strong statement that will guide tribunals uh, and uh, make sure that they don't interpret any of the substantive obligation uh, in a way that undermines that. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Um, I will move on to look at uh, some of the questions that we have been asked. And the first I see on my screen is addressed to Janssen. And it concerns an issue that arose with the louder arbitrations during the peso crisis. There was a difference and division of opinion across different, different tribunals. 
particularly regarding the application of the essential security interest defense. And with this increasing claims that is expected after the pandemic, do you think that the same issue of conflicting parallel decisions, they're different in, 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 in their conclusions, will arise? And how can institutions navigate through this? Um, thanks, Loretta. Uh, so certainly, in in the louder case, and uh, the uh, and in the and in the Argentina cases, where you had similar claims being brought under similar treaties um, against the same respondent, but by by different claimants, um, there was the problem where different tribunals took different views and and decided in different ways on, uh, on the same language in treaties. So for example, in, in the US treaties with Argentina, um, as you mentioned, the, the essential security provision there, and in the louder cases, simply on two very similar European BITs, a European BIT and a US BIT um, on the question of fair and equitable treatment. I mean, that continues to be a weakness in the system that the coordination of similar claims um, is exceptionally problematic and essentially comes down to the uh, decision of the litigants themselves and their willingness to allow for consolidation in the absence of anything in arbitral rules or in treaties which would allow tribunals to do so on their own. And, and those are few and far between. And that's one of the one of the arguments that's made in UNCITRAL Working Group 3 with respect to the benefits of having a unified multilateral court um, would be that this kind of consolidation um, would be facilitated through having a single body that be in the position to hear all the claims. So I think the short answer there is to, to that question is that, yes, absolutely, this continues to be a risk. I mean, treaties, as, as Sylvia has noted, just by pointing to Canada's uh, treaty with the European Union and CETA, treaties are becoming more heterogeneous um, in terms of what they provide. So what's found in CETA um, is, is not likely to be found um, in treaties of an older vintage, um, but where you do have multiple claims being brought under something like the Energy Charter Treaty or something like a, an OECD style treaty, um, then you know this risk uh, is certainly a real one for interpretation and application. Oh, and sorry to Anna, by the way, I, I mean old OECD style, not current OECD style, of course. Thank you, thank you very much, Janssen. Um, the next question I have is not addressed to anyone in particular, but I think it could be a question for Ramesh, and it's from Professor Kassantinidis of Qatar University. He asks uh, that parties to an investment dispute may use the COVID-19 crisis as a pretext to further delay the constitution of tribunals. How should appointing authorities react to and avoid such an eventuality? So it's all, it's, it's, it's really, you know, an assessment on a case by case basis. What are there real reasons why this delay is taking place? And I think, you know, you just, you can't just say, well, it, because of COVID, let's, let's just delay this process. Um, I didn't really, un I, I didn't clearly understand if it's an appointment, basically, you know, how, how COVID could really become uh, a, a, a delay because you, you, you've got email communications I'd expect between the parties and the constitution would be done by the institution which without the need for a physical presence of anybody so I'm, I, I'm sort of at a bit of a loss to understand exactly why um, there'd be a delay in the appointment process because I, I could see that all being done over the internet and I can't really answer for the uh, for the person who asked the question, Professor Kosantinidis, but I suppose it could, I could envisage a situation perhaps where the parties themselves um, are slow in constituting the tribunal and 
the appointing authority may have to step in. I mean, there may be uh, a lagging of time, uh, particularly uh, due to the situation, the crisis, because parties ask for extensions, and, and perhaps that would throw a spanner into the proceedings that way. And is there something an appointing authority can do to intervene? But I don't want to put words in his mouth. I'll check if he's added something um, yeah. to clarify, but not yet. But maybe he will later on. Okay, and, uh, but know, again, I, I think case by case. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Depending it's on it's the a rules situation. Of the institution. Yeah. And ultimately, uh, if and a party drags its feet for the appointment of an arbitrator, the institution will do it for the party, and that's not always necessarily a the best case, case scenario. Although institutions can appoint very perfectly good arbitrators, but still, parties may want still retain the right to appoint an arbitrator of their choice. Um, I had one a question about states police powers, uh, the states police powers doctrine as recognized in by various tribunals in Saluka, TechMed and Philip Morris versus Uruguay to justify regulatory actions in respect of COVID-19 and refuse investor claims for compensation. And this could be a question for either Janssen or Romesh. Can the states use their the police powers doctrine to justify their regulatory actions? Well, I think the answer is they they can certainly try. Um, the question is, can they satisfy you know, <laughs> successfully use uh, I, that well, they did doctrine? Philip Morris. They did in Philip did. Morris, although Philip Morris was not a uni uh, unanimous decision. Uh, it, it was a two-one split there with uh, one uh, arbitrator. Among those that I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the possibilities in future uh, tribunals, um, saying that in fact no, these were unreasonable measures uh, taken for the plain packaging of tobacco. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with what something Sylvie said earlier, which is that in principle, I think properly understood, these treaties should not be should not be an invitation for tribunals to engage in a proportionality analysis of. Um, of state measures, particularly the general state measures taken for uh, general regulatory public purpose. Um, but on the other hand, um, there are tribunals that will do so. Um, and, the and the treaties are not always clear, um, not always as clear as Canada's. So unless you have something like Annex B of uh, the 2004 US model BIT, which explains the ground rules for interpreting an indirect expropriation claim, you have to argue public, uh, sorry, police powers. Um, and whether that's successful may well depend upon the, the, the tribunal that you have. And it's also worth pointing out the police powers is typically thought of as an aspect of expropriation analysis, whereas though for national treatment and for fair and equitable treatment, um, police powers does not not fit as neatly, and one ends up needing to make different arguments, um, which may require further scrutiny, or may invite at least further scrutiny by the tribunal. Can I, could I say something? Um, and, and the other point to police powers, I think, is it's not this blank check that you can give to governments to do whatever they want. There are limits to police powers, and that's an important aspect of police powers. It's got to be a bona fide measure. It has to be non-discriminatory. I think there's numbers. There is a number of uh, uh, cases that talk about the types of limits that you have on police powers. So, you know, it's it, and I don't think anyone could uh, uh, argue saying, well, the states have the right to regulate. Uh, you know, and and be it health be it the environment, and, you know, all of these very, very important issues need to be regulated, but there are limits. It's a bit like wars have limits. These regulations have limits as well. Um, and so that I think the question is, well, where do those limits start kicking in? Thank you very much, Ramesh. And we have one last question, I believe, from Dr. Aziz, and that is about 
the moratoria proposals, there have been two uh, that I know of so far, one by the International Institute for Sustainable Development and the other by Colombia's uh, Center on Sustainable Development, uh, Investment, sorry. And both call for a suspension of investor state arbitration and it's been mentioned by um, some of you during your presentations, but I think Dr. Aziz would like to know if anyone, what everybody in the panel thinks about the feasibility of these proposals and if they're not feasible, why not? I think somebody has already expressed their views and maybe others may still wish to, to say something in that regard. I personally find them very interesting and I think I was, when I was reading them, I was thinking it may create a new class of arbitrators, these sort of, you know, uh, conscientious objectors types arbitrators who refuse to accept appointments because <laughs> for ethical reasons <laughs> to avoid being involved in this huge claims against the poor states. I think Anna wants to say something. Happy to say something at the, at the beginning. I think that for a kind of moratorium, I think Jansson mentioned a little that and I agree with him. You need two issues. First, governmental will, because I think that the two moratoriums has emerged more from academic NGO things. And, and of course there are governments that maybe are aligned, but you need the governmental will because they, they should set up, you know, that this is the basic issue. The second <coughs> basic issue is that you need an agreement, uh, like kind, kind of formalization. And, and this, as I seen that Jensen mentioned at the beginning, it takes some time. What I would say that could be possible, but again, I'm speaking and I, because I, I don't represent the government that are in the OECD. I don't know if they want to do that or not. This is something that could emerge at the OECD or we could in, in, in another forum. But, but I think that what could be possible is a, a strong in a statement of interpretation in the kind of what Sylvie talked about the, the, the articles in CETA, at least this in the short term will give some kind of framework if cases emerge in terms of the right to regulate and particularly in health issues. I think that this could be uh, useful. The other thing that could be useful, and I think that some of you mentioned also that, is like a, it's true that the reform, there are some call of reforms and then UNCTAD OECD and all this stuff, but at the UNC trial, the discussions are very focused on investor state dispute settlement because this is the mandate that they have. And we haven't tackled back the, the real reform stuff. That, and, and I would say that there are a lot of good ideas in the last agreement, in set agreement, in the, in the CTPP, there are good reforms agreement, but still we are with the bulk of existing agreement that have broad definition of fair and equitable treatment where we know that are most of the cases there. That means that it's a call, maybe a statement, is a short-term reaction, and maybe a necessity to reform provisions that are more substantive. And I think that uh, uh, to avoid that in the short, medium term, these kind of agreements are used in, in the bad way. This is what, uh, what I think like uh, right now. Janssen? Yeah, just to go, to go back to, to what I had said in, in my remarks and, and to follow up what, what Anna is, is saying. I do think that the Sachs proposal is 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 probably a non-starter, but I do think that um, in terms of something like a joint declaration or like a joint statement of understanding and intent as to the meaning of uh, investment treaties, scope, etc., um, that perhaps is is something that is more easily easily uh, attained. Although again coordination costs and the difficulties are are formidable um, in terms of getting getting states to act and to act to act promptly um, and I mean but I do see that as perhaps the only um, of these proposals so far that I think has potential legs thank you very much Janssen um, I don't think there are any further questions from the participants so unless any one of you has anything to add i think we can wrap up this session which i for one found extremely interesting and thought-provoking and i'm really glad that the center for international law has had this initiative of a series of webinars on the issues that we're confronted with in trying to create a new international legal order after this 
terrible pandemic, a word that we hardly recognize anymore, but I, I'm an optimist by nature, so I want to think that there will be, as Jansen said earlier, more opportunities for all of us in terms of um, de developing new practices, new best practices, and in a certain way for us who are sitting in Asia, Asia may be leading by example on how the pandemic should be addressed effectively, and other governments in other parts of the world may be looking at Asia uh, now because we are in a sense the future, uh, even though some countries are now, as they open up, experiencing a little bit of a return back to to difficult situations, but it probably makes sense for the rest of the world to look at what Asia is doing at the moment. And thank you again to all the participants from all over the world for listening to us, paying attention, and even though we don't see them, we wish them a very nice evening or rest of the day. Thank you all, and thank you to the Center for International Law. Bye-bye. And I hope all of our listeners will join me in thanking Loretta and all of our panelists for bringing their knowledge to a very insightful and interesting discussion today. If you enjoyed today's session, please be sure to register for the very last in our series, which will take place next Wednesday, entitled, Where is ASEAN in COVID-19? Thank you again for the Center for International Law. Have a great evening. <laughs>